to of the new global edition. I am really pleased to inaugurate this new global edition, which is already the sixth one. And uh, we are really thrilled to have uh, 23 new students in this edition. I think we have to understand this as, as a very clear success, considering how difficult are the circumstances we are living in now. And uh, you guys are very brave people, and we are really grateful for your determination to apply and follow the masters, which as you know, it's based on mobility in Europe and beyond. So thank you very much for being on board. And we really expect to make your learning journey worth it. And uh, what we can promise is that we'll give our best to do that. Before I give the floor to our keynote guest, our beloved Susan, Susan Robertson, let me share with you a few reflections on the meaning of our master in the current societal and global change. As the 21st century progresses, we seem to live in a dystopian world. And the last dystopia is the COVID crisis and the many effects this is having uh, at a global scale. This crisis, you know, affects us all, but hits terribly to those that are in the global south and the poorer sectors in the global north. Undoubtedly, poverty and higher inequalities are increasing as a result of this global health crisis and put as well a tremendous challenge to national governments and supranational organizations to manage the effects of this crisis. As we know, education is also being radically affected. Uh, the absence of schooling and the digital divide increases education inequalities, but they also impact on the basic structure of the message of education systems. So curriculum, pedagogy, evaluation, and even what we consider legitimate spaces of learning are in process of change as a result of this crisis. I think it is therefore a crucial moment for understanding what is going on in education globally and what kind of policies are necessary to face the transformation caused by this crisis. So globality is in that sense, and from this point of view, meaningful than ever, we could say. But the COVID crisis is not the only challenge education faces today. Despite Basil Bernstein reminded us that, as uh, we know that education cannot compensate for society, it is also true that education cannot ignore society. And as we enter into the third decade of the 21st century, there are many societal challenges that impact on education and need to respond from education as a social policy. There are, if you like, many questions here to explore. Has education the same position of value? That is, is education able to position individuals in the social scale as it used to do in the 21st, in, in the 20th century, sorry? Is access to education sufficient for equality of opportunities? How much education as a public good is left? And what are the new powerful actors that dominate the global education markets? These and many other questions are necessary to explore. And we really expect to explore many of them with you in our courses. But let me just point out one question that I think we have not explored enough and that has radical implications for education and refers to those aspects of education that have to do with socialization with the role of education for citizenship and the race of democratic consciousness, if you like. These social functions of education are altered today, among other things, by, by the role that algorithms play in our lives. Algorithms control if, what we buy, what we watch in Netflix, where we want to go on holidays, whether we will be productive enough in our workplace. But as Yuval Harari states, they have also the ability to control what we think and have the capacity to shape aspects such as our political opinions or even our desires. 
the power of algorithms and free will and informs us about the role that social media, social networks play in our everyday lives. So if education is about socialization and consciousness formation, then we have to be aware that it competes today with a monster very difficult to beat. And I think this demonstrates more than ever the power that ideas and discourses play to understand our everyday lives. As discourses and ideologies have privileged channels to circulate and impact on people's beliefs and even desires, material transformation may lose protagonism and ideas and discourses become a key input for power and domination. It's not by chance, I would say that today, Susan Robertson's speech focuses on what she calls the production of imaginaries by key international organizations in the field of education. As she calls them, these guardians of the future in education are, we, can, we could say that there are also many other guardians of the future in all fields uh, of our everyday lives. Education needs to be aware of this to equip students with tools and abilities to uncover how power and domination operates. The role of education for critical citizenship as the space with the capacity to form critical minds able to unmask these forms of domination is therefore, a, is therefore, therefore sorry, a crucial role today. That's why I think the approach that Susan is sharing with us today makes full sense and is highly necessary. We need to understand how discourses and visions are defined and circulated as forms of development, but also as forms of domination. I am delighted to introduce to all of you Professor Susan Robertson, who you should know is much more than an excellent academic scholar for us. <laughs> Susan is currently Professor of Sociology of Education and Head of the Faculty of Education in the University of Cambridge. In, in the UK. And prior to Cambridge, Susan has held professional, uh, professorial posts in Bristol, Auckland in New Zealand, in, and Perth in Australia. Over the years, she has pursued a research and teaching agenda broadly concerned with transformations of the state and education, the changing geographies of state projects, the rise of global and regional actors in education, and how these shifts selectively alter distributional politics and outcomes. She is author of more than 100 publications in these fields. Susan has been as well a grant holder of European Commission funded projects, as well as the UK's ESRC and New Zealand Marsden Fund. And her most recent works on the future of anticipatory global governance, as you have seen in her paper today, and uh, she's currently also the founding editor and editor-in-chief of Globalization Societies and Education. Beyond Susan's formal CV, which is very impressive, I would like to point out two aspects of Susan's work and her intellectual position. One thing you should know, it's her great ability to integrate different sources of knowledge which she considers a must to understand the current transformations of education and society. I think Susan's work escapes from all types of parochialism in education. She integrates sources of knowledge from sociology, political economy, geography, and philosophy even, to theorize and produce the necessary corpus of knowledge to understand education and society today. So we could say, that education is not the point of departure, but the point of arrival in Susan's work. A second aspect of her work that I really admire is her capacity to anticipate which are the key questions that have to be answered in the field of globalization and education. Susan is highly innovative in the definition of objects of studies and in the way she approaches them. It's not by chance, I would say, even that Susan studies anticipatory governance, because she has a great ability to anticipate herself what are the crucial debates and the critical questions that have to be answered in the field of the political economy of education. You should know that many of us have benefited from, from her work, uh, and also together with our dearest colleague, Professor Roger Dale, and Globit is undoubtedly in debt 
with them because they introduced many of us into this fascinating field. There are, of course, many other things we can mention of Susan's work, but I think the best thing we can do is to, to hear her and uh, to, to see how she focuses on these ideas of the guardians of the future. So thank you, Susan, for accepting our invitation, and I give you the floor now. Thanks. So before I share my slides, just to say um, to uh, Leia, um, to Xavi and to Tony, um, so thank you for organizing, for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, meet and speak. Um, in another world, I would be there. Um, I've spent many, many um, occasions there at the Autonomous University. You get on the train and you go out um, to the university, lovely train ride um, and a beautiful city. Um, but more, more than that, I mean, I think the project that Xavier and later colleagues have been able to um, develop there in the Department of Sociology is um, an incredibly important and a uni unique space. Um, and as students actually enrolled in the GlobEd course, um, if you don't know it already, you'll come to benefit hugely from the uh, ways in which um, colleagues there in the Department of Sociology have been able to really get um, quite an interesting, a really interesting globalization and education um, agenda um, on the table. So, uh, so thank you so much. Um, and uh, also just use if there's things that you're thinking about um, that at the end we can uh, pick up out of chat to um, have a wide ranging conversation, then please do use that space. Um, most of you have seen the paper um, that was circulated. Um, it's accepted and is coming out in a journal called A Global Society. Um, it's quite interesting, there's not much education writing in there, even though it's an international relations journal. Um, and as Xavier said to start with, education is a field. Um, and in order to study that field, so it's not a discipline, it's a field. In order to study that field, if you're thinking about um, labor markets, um, governance projects, uh, the ways in which uh, education is often used for things like diplomacy, um, it's used often for purposes of development. So that range of discipline areas, or indeed if a geography is a field, um, a whole range of different areas almost need to come together um, in order for you to be able to explore the kinds of things that you're, you're potentially interested in. So let's go to the screen share and here we go and I'll go right back to the beginning and just let me know if you're if if that's good can you see the whole screen yeah yeah no okay. problem because i've got two desktops here and sometimes it splits itself in such a way that um, it's only i'm told at the end they couldn't see the, the full screen so i have called this paper um, guardians of the future and I've been interested with the group of people who I've been working uh, with on um, what they're describing broadly as anticipatory global governance. Um, and it's a newer area to do with thinking about global governance, um, the anticipatory part that uh, writers like uh, John Burton, uh, Matt Crank, um, those two specifically have been driving an interesting intellectual project. And so some of the other writers in this special issue uh, of which this particular paper is a part is thinking also about the World Bank, uh, about NATO um, and, and so on. But it was, it, was, it was really interesting for me to um, kind of make, try and make a decision for myself. I thought initially I was going to only look at um, the OECD or only or UNESCO only. Um, UNESCO for the moment has a quite a large project on um, the future, it's an international commission on the futures of education. Um, but what I decided to do is to uh, try and run a comparison between two international organizations to see what might ultimately be revealed when you look at uh, international organizations, you know, over the long, longer kind of period, what might we see if we compared two international organizations in terms of their anticipatory strategies? And so 
what I'm going to do um, today is I'm going to spend a bit of time thinking with you around, you know, where is the typical social science lens? And uh, like a Pagerai, I think typically we, we look at the rear view mirror and we don't spend enough time thinking about the way in which um, powerful organisations that would include um, capitalists, essentially the, the capitalist wants tomorrow to be like today. And so the capitalist is always reaching out to shape the future. Um, and in such a way that that future arrives, but in, a, in, in such a way it favours the, the capitalist. And Tony's written quite a lot on trade agreements and he would recognise exactly what I'm going to say. When you try and colonise the future in the interests of um, the reproduction of the capitalist class, what you're ultimately doing is you're shaping the future. But almost by definition, the future can't be known. So how do you make a certain kind of future known and in a particular way so that we don't even begin to think about the fact that there could have been alternate possibilities? So to, to just start with Arjuna Pajurai, and this is a lovely book that um, in fact, I hadn't read until one of the reviewers pointed out um, that um, a Pedrai's book on the future is a cultural fact. And really what he's reminding us there of is that not all cultures share the same understanding of the future. And we'll begin to see that this is particularly the, the case with uh, particularly UNESCO. Certainly in the very early days of UNESCO, um, and I'm going to use two words that you'll begin to see the contrast for UNESCO. In the very early days of UNESCO, there was quite a heated debate between uh, the Europeans fundamentally, um, who looked forward, looked and looked forward to the with the idea of becoming. Okay, and if you look at many of the UNESCO reports and over time, the idea of being more or less gets shelved and the idea of becoming, and now we can see social mobility, becoming someone, the forward momentum of modernity, uh, modernization, always this forward momentum. But I'm going to reflect um, on a moment when um, Nehru, when they take UNESCO, uh, there's a seminar that they launch in India um, in about 1947, 48. And Nero, at the end of this conference, and it's where the East and the West are still coming together, um, pauses and he says, if the future is essentially science and, and a focus on cognition, what about spirituality? What about all of the conditions for being? And though I haven't seen the final book, um, some of you might um, become, as you do this course, um, the work of Bo Ventura de Sousa Santos. Um, and Santos is in this book that he's currently writing, is going back to the space where one might recover some of the cultural resources to think about being and not becoming. Okay, so this is about living in the present and with the whole sense of oneself, religion, spirituality, nature, um, and so on, as opposed to this accumulator, forward momentum, grasping the future in order to deliver. Um, and in this case, and we're going to explore a little bit of this today, um, modernization, modernity, enlightenment, all of the kind of the forward momentum as opposed to the, 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 the kind of the present and the, the wholeness of the present. So, uh, uh, Padurai basically says the lens of pastness then, um, so we've got this forward momentum happening, yet on the other hand, in the academy, we have a, we have a preoccupation with the past. Um, the logic of reproduction, so here we'd be thinking of Bernstein, um, Bourdieu, the force of custom, okay, the anthropologists, the dynamics of memory, the persistence of habitus, the glacial movement of the everyday, and the cunning of tradition, although we know tradition is always invented. Um, so social science tends, um, and the argument really from the colleagues working on anticipatory global governance or, or thinking about time present, but particularly time future, 
has more or less been ignored. Um, and most of the writers on time would probably agree with that. Barbara Adams, um, Hilga Nowotny um, writes on this. Um, so sociology has been particularly underdeveloped. Um, it's tended to think of time in the present, clock time, um, making time, you know, being out of time. So this is all kind of presentism. But the future as a resource to be captured, colonized, and represented as an inevitable outcome, um, as if the past really reproduces the future, um, is somewhat problematic. So that's the kind of territory I'm interested in exploring. So what Barbara Adams is actually arguing too is certainly when um, the uh, traditional um, societies or societies with different understandings of time. Um, there's a book coming out from Will Brain um, uh, that's actually looking at some of the what they call the mandala societies, um, and these would be or mandala kingdoms, and these would be places like um, the Cambodia. Um, probably around Tibet and so on. So this idea of the circular world, okay? Um, that, that things came around, um, it wasn't this linear forward momentum um, idea. So the layering of time, um, you know, because actually there's an awful lot of repetition, repetition even on a daily basis. So at Barbara Adams says this, she says, from a predestined realm of unique individuals and groups, the future was transmuted into an abstract, empty, and quantifiable entity, freely or available for free, unrestricted use and exploitation. So if I use a concrete example here, um, what the OECD is doing with its big data now, when it represents um, these vertically organized um, hierarchies of the best country right through to the worst country in terms of PISA, it's giving you a potential future that you have to aspire to. The future is what you should be doing um, to reproduce what, is, what it is that the winners up there, so winners being kind of labeled, have actually done. So there's a, an effort to um, claim that future, to uh, represent that future as in this case um, with PISA, a global competition, um, and to avoid the, the, the identity essentially um, and a form of consciousness that would then go with it uh, to do with actually being winners and losers in a global competition. And I'll get there as part of the kind of final um, moment that I explore. So today what I'm going to explore is three moments of crisis. Um, and the argument will be that essentially crises become um, opportunities to break open hegemonic uh, projects, uh, which are always um, under kind of repair, under work, you know, efforts to kind of keep that hegemonic uh, project um, secure um, and not available for uh, rival um, representations and rival futures. So I'm asking the question of what of time future, either as a, um, this is how the literature would uh, talk about this. In fact, this is actually a, a framing from uh, the work of Lumen. Um, of a present future, by, by that I mean a, a, a present future is the future that's arrived, and by a future present, it would be trying to represent out there a future that at some point is going to emerge, that you want that future to fundamentally be a present at some point going forward. And the argument I'll be developing in this paper is that um, international organizations, governments even doing education policy are always claiming the future. Um, but international organizations have limited mechanisms for governing. Um, they don't um, have legal structures that we can formally enforce. Um, typically they run on conventions or recommendations um, and so on. Um, so what they have got then is uh, a governance challenge that would uh, push them to be then thinking about different ways in which they might legitimately govern globally through forms of transnational governance, but be governors in the world of education when 
education typically is regarded as a constitutional responsibility of either a national state or a subnational state. And in the case of Spain, there would be some competition actually as to whether it's Madrid or um, a regional um, um, state uh, province, however you want to represent um, Catalonia. And so there's competition over governing even in sub in national and subnational kind of settings. So the point really is that crises open up the space for competing visions of the future. And we know this right at the moment to do with COVID. Uh, the ed tech firms have moved in absolutely rapidly and they have a vision of the future right at the moment that is an ed tech vision. Um, it's artificial intelligence, uh, it is uh, big data and so on. So crises open up the space for competing visions of the future. And as Misha's describes it, these are moments of what she describes as hyper projectivity, meaning these are sites of heightened future oriented public debate about possible futures. And I have no doubt in your university there, as mine here in Cambridge, is we're now debating something we never thought was on the table. You know, can we do digitally mediated teaching? Cambridge would have always said absolutely not. Definitely not. Um, and these are actually now uh, discussions um, underway that would change the character of education in a very old institution that's quite ossified in many ways called Cambridge. So I'm going to be developing a comparative analysis of the anticipatory practices deployed over time by these two international organizations, UNESCO and the OECD. And in a way, the choice of these two uh, organizations was in part because um, I'd become quite interested in the contemporary moment of where each of them is trying to um, capture something of the uh, sustainable development goals, but particularly uh, thinking about um, the notion of global citizenship. Um, and the OECD has been quite interested in that, but certainly um, UNESCO has partly been given that task. Um, and so that became my initial kind of entry point. But I became really intrigued, if you go back and look at um, the, the, these two organizations, more or less coming out of the Second World War, to slightly different um, ones, um, a bit further advanced than the other in terms of UNESCO is the oldest institution um, immediately in the post-war period. And um, the OECD gets um, actually formally formed as the OECD, uh, but it is a post-war institution. It comes out of the, uh, the restructuring that's taking place in Europe and then basically gets its own legs in the early 1960s. And I'm interested in exploring whether uh, there are different histories, missions, resources, and geopolitical alliances, because according to most people who look at these two organizations, uh, UNESCO struggles and the OECD seems to have been the master governor. Um, the, the bank, well, banks often got major legitimation problems. Um, it seems to, from time to time or decade to, to get decade, get into an awful kind of mess in the 80s. It in, in, insisted on um, you know, privatization and that became very problematic and it had to kind of cover those things up. So there'd be an interesting, um, and some of you might want to do that, is do a comparison that draws the World Bank in um, to see in fact, in fact, what kind of argument you might want to make in relation to these two other institutions. So that's a potential project for um, several of you going forward. Um, they seem to use um, different anticipatory practices, and I've phrased these as one called a philosophy of the future, which is UNESCO, and the OECD typically engages in a science of the future. Um, one of my colleagues, Faisal Rizvi, pointed out that um, a Pagerai makes quite an interesting distinction and calls it about an ethics of future possibility, which would be more the philosophy part, and um, an ethics of future probability. And so probability is um, statistics, probabilistic kind of thinking, um, and essentially, you know, calculating, so forms of calculation about which future is likely to arrive. And that's definitely the kind of work that the OECD has done his, both historically and continues to actually um, do that. 
So I'm interested in whether these different anticipatory practices actually disguise values. Each of these are underpinned by values. They can't not be in a politics. Um, but if one disguises those values and the other make those values much more explicit, does that actually alter um, the way in which one can claim, um, and it does, the future, um, and in fact actually ri ricochets out or, or generates out a whole series of other kind of governing programs, and this is the OECD, where the UNESCO has found it very, very difficult and over time to be a player. It tends to come in and, and become a governor under conditions of emergency. So it's not the, it's not the natural so-called guardian. Um, and I'd say the master guardian fundamentally, um, and we can talk about that, is the OECD. Um, but these two organizations, to make the story really interesting, have um, engaged uh, in kind of ongoing kind of turf wars about um, uh, who gets to dominate future making. Uh, because fundamentally, um, UNESCO represents, it is a global institution. The OECD tries to represent itself as a global institution, and, but it's, a, um, it's a, an intergovernmental organization, which means that only a certain number of governments, and these are typically the developed economies, um, are members of the OECD. But as people like Tony and Xavier and others have, have also written, um, the OECD has kind of reached out into low income countries. It's got PISA for development. Uh, it's got PISA for you. It's got baby PISA. It's got TALIS. It's got the global competence. It's got many programs now and tries to assert, even though it's um, it's it's um, intergovernmental nature basically means that in fact, it doesn't represent many, many of these countries don't have forms of representation to actually determine the agenda for the OECD. Um, and if you want to kind of look at um, another piece of writing that I could have spoken to today, but haven't, um, it's where I'm actually looking at the real challenges and the limits to the OECD's governing on the global competence front um, in a paper that has come out um, earlier this year. So, the bit that I think makes my paper a slightly different read to the other papers in the special issue is that I'm particularly interested in what happens when an, a promised future, let's say the OECD's all boats rising with neoliberalism arrives and how does it manage and mediate now a problematic present? Because these futures are promises and those futures don't necessarily come in the form of everyone sharing the outcomes of neoliberalism as a political project. So I'll start with just a, and I'll try and get a little bit more pace um, behind this. So I'm going to start with Jens Beckett's uh, really interesting work, uh, but it's not unique to Beckett, um, but he is developing what he calls a sociology of, um, of capitalism, actually, and the way capitalists particularly go after the future, um, trade negotiators par excellence. So the key questions are, who gets to imagine the future if by de definition it's not known? So by definition it's not known. What techniques and instruments are deployed to deliver? future presence, so the future de being delivered as a present, how are future presents managed when they arrive in ways that uh, those who try to legitimately govern actually have to face up to the fact that <laughs> that future's not particularly nice. Um, and what challenges do they, what are sometimes call these forms of precision governance, um, you know, using big data and so on, face in the context of uncertainty, rupture, unpredictability and variegation? So Adams and Groves, um, in quite an interesting paper that you could go off and take a look at, um, talk about three forms of knowledge about the future. One is amongst traditional societies where there's an extension of the present. Um, and, and essentially you can see this is where the seasons come and go. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of a seasonal and elements of our contemporary societies um, nevertheless have some, some elements of these an extension of the present. Um, the, or we might think of it as a continuation of the, pro, of the past to be understood through, through scientific techniques such as correlation and calculation, but this is always 
um, available data, isn't it? Because by definition, if we can't know the future, then we're looking back at the past and we're trying to calculate using um, various forms of data, forms of prediction and so on, what might actually be around the corner. Um, or it might be seen as a, a, a means of mapping possible, probable or preferred futures in a non-deterministic kind of way. So different societies, um, and again, uh, there's a lovely book by Koselik um, on the, the overlappings of, of, of time, different rhythms of, of, of futures and time. The work of Tavery and uh, Elias of, uh, is, is also interesting. They focus specifically on anticipation. So this is about um, how we anticipate um, and you can think of all the different ways in which, you know, we just took life for granted. We anticipated we'd leave school. Many of you, potentially, you go to university. Um, but think of the way in which COVID interrupted those anticipations, that you now had to stand uh, one and a half, if not two metres behind someone else or bypass them on a footpath when essentially we would expect to be closer to an individual, either to speak to them, or we would be packed much more tightly in a shopping queue. We all had to think about these moment to moment anticipations. You know, could you um, anticipate, for example, what today or next week and those kinds of, these moment by moment anticipations. And I would say that typically the temp the anticipation theorists don't spend much time on that, that first element, but it's definitely been there through COVID. The second one is the actor's trajectories through time, which proceed in a more or less predictable way. So we get to go to school, we have to, we leave, we go to, you know, university or another place of work. Um, and, and you can think social scientists have got lots of, we talk about trajectories, we talk about um, the um, careers, um, we talk about social mobility, there's a whole um, array of language that's talking about these forms of predictability. You know, Germans talk about life course theory and so on, and that's this kind of unfolding in fairly predictable ways. Um, but again, we don't know the future, so we try and make these futures kind of happen. And then the final one is plans in the temporal landscapes, which are the overarching temporal orientations which guide actions. So think of all the things that universities had to throw up in the air, the calendar of events, benchmarking, sequencing, large planning endeavors and so on. Um, and there's many different ways in which you can think, you know, calendars um, in and out, when exams happen, um, et cetera. So these are different temporal kind of elements um, with different kinds of activity. One of them is kind of deeply structuring in, in many ways so that, that it guides us into the future in a specific kind of way. Now, if we go to the international organizations, so we come back to them and think about this case. Um, I've made the point already that um, international organizations have major challenges because essentially they don't have constitutional um, responsibility and therefore they are limited in the kind of authority that they can actually claim to be governors. So that's the important part. Um, typically, they're often um, uh, dependent on what's called uh, input and output forms of legitimacy as the dominant form of authority. So how much resources might be going into something and what the outputs, the OECD specifically is uh, incredibly, um, it, it claims, um, forms of expertise um, and its authority, therefore, as a governor is often drawn from the fact that it presents itself as an expert um, across a whole range of areas to do with education, but particularly um, in student performance. Um, so what makes an outstanding student, 15-year-old um, on mathematics, science, literacy, and, and so on. So the point essentially here is that the international organizations are, are attracted and you could see why they'd be attracted to anticipatory governance devices, strategies and devices. Um, and, 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 and essentially I'm using Beckett's work. Uh, what he's actually arguing, and this is where I'm kind of linking it to a promised future that arrives, but actually it's, 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 a, it's a, a future that's highly problematic, um, that there's a limit then 
that promissory leg legitimacy actually also has um, potentially um, problems attached to it. So let's get into these two cases. Um, we've, so I pose these questions, are there struggles? So I'm just repeating uh, myself. And the three moments I actually want to look at and draw out some kind of headline kind of understandings is the immediate period in the post-war, and it was the creation of these two organ international organizations, um, but they were also tasked with creating a new wor world order through the development of education. So up until that point, um, primary education would have been a guarantee, but in the post-war period and onwards, what's happening is two forms of development, um, nation building, through education, so that was an important moment. The uh, many of the countries that had been colonies and that claimed uh, their own nationhood in the post-war period um, were also looking for guidance in terms of the development of education. And Xavi and Tony have written fairly extensively um, on these kind in, in this kind of period. Um, then I want to look at the 1970s as an iconic moment of uh, really a radical um, kind of, uh, in, in, it would be in uh, Gramsci's terms, an organic crisis. Um, so a contingent crisis would be, you know, a disturbance maybe just in the area of education, but an organic crisis um, would be a disturbance both in the economy and more broadly within the society. And that definitely, I'd say the post-war period, definitely the 1970s. Perhaps less so with this moment, I'm going to the final moment, the 2008 financial crisis and the development of global citizenship. Um, but as, because I, I think it's probably a little bit more, it, it doesn't ultimately dislodge the rise and the rise and the rise of finance capital because the banks actually were bailed out by governments. Uh, but quite likely um, the combination of the financial crisis and COVID um, and the cost of COVID um, together uh, is likely to present something at least around the corner, if not sooner. So UNESCO's mandate was shaped by three broad ideas, and it's a really interesting institution. Um, the belief, um, which to some extent comes out of uh, the League of Nations that was actually um, um, created through the middle of the First World War. Um, so the belief in an evolution toward a world society and citizen, um, and, and this is something particularly that someone like Julian Huxley, who was the first director general of UNESCO in, when it was established in 1946, uh, the idea that you, science should be transnational. And so, and, and it, this now emerges out of, if you leave science to the nation, and if you look at the dropping of the atomic bomb in Japan, the argument here was that was highly problematic. And if you wanted an international society, um, a world society, then science should be policed, not at the national level, because here you'd actually have um, the tendencies toward fascism, Nazism, and so on. Um, and the sciences that might go along with that, if you think of um, Germany and the rise of fascism and the role of scientists there. Um, and the final idea was this idea, and this comes out of the League of Nations, the idea of scientific internationalism. Okay? So um, in the League of Nations, there was this very strong idea that if you get all of the, the, um, the science of the world, um, and here it would be um, theories of relativity, all of the great and the good found their way to Paris in the 1920s. Um, and uh, this would be Maria Montessori, um, Einstein, all of them would have traveled to Paris and actually um, engaged in debates as part of scientific internationalism. And if you take a look at the International Commission on the Futures of Education, that's going right on right now that will actually report was kicked off last year and report um, in October of this year. Um, what you'll see is that same patterning of the assembling of um, important people, Arjuna Padrai is in that list, um, Antonio Novo, as some of you will become familiar with, he's in that list, Karen Mundy. Um, it's quite interesting if you look at who are these 
international scientists who've been brought together to think about the future of education right now. Um, and some of you also might want to think of actually looking at the genesis of that project um, and the outputs of that project It'd be a fantastic project to do. Um, what the and, and there's what's called uh, an kind of an ideas lab on the side, um, and this really takes forward the way in which UNESCO is working, even in the late 40s um, and into as it as it kind of rolls out. Um, the I'm just just ignore my phone. So I'll, just, I'll just put it down. The OECD, nevertheless, so this is an institution that puts values. A, science, a philosophy of the future at the heart of what it's trying to do. And it's speaking to a global world, but the global world is not always in agreement with what ultimately is the early domination um, in, in, in Huxley's, the first director general in Huxley's world of what he thought was the superior, um, uh, cult the superior cultivated European. And it would be those, um, New, newly emerging countries that should um, learn from the science and the, the, the kind of cultivated nature of the, of the United States of America and the so-called developed world. What the OECD does is it engages not with a, uh, with a philosophy of the future, but with a science of the future. And the science of the future that it adopted was modernization theory. Um, and a lovely book, uh, Mandarins of the Future by uh, Nick Gilman, is a, just a fantastic read. So it immediately um, takes from the United States. So it's modeling itself pretty much on what's going on in the United States that had a similar kind of governance issue. Um, the federal government was trying to, through the period of the Cold War, govern um, the, um, and, and certainly with Sputnik, govern uh, the states of the United States, but the federal government has no um, capacity constitutionally to govern. And, and some of that sorting out of that governing challenge of the federal government in the United States trying to govern its states that had constitutional um, authority or, this, or, or local communities, school boards and so on. Um, and so this starts in America and it goes across to the OECD and Daniel Troll has written beautiful work on this. Um, and there's a four part kind of series of steps a present analysis, a future estimation, implementation programs, and finance models. So on the one side, we get UNESCO and the philosophers and the scientists and so on, um, and wanting kind of global dialogue and a debate and so on. And on the other side with the OECD, what we get is the economists and the statisticians uh, along with the educators. So we have two different kinds of expertise in that space. The one thing to say about UNESCO is the United States backs the OECD. It fell in and out of love, mostly out of love with UNESCO, and the UK would always kind of follow. Um, in the very early days of UNESCO, it tried to impose statistics and it often saw UNESCO as riddled with um, communist ideas, socialist ideas and so on. And periodically it would withdraw um, funding. Um, and so UNESCO was always poor, it basically had no money and it depended on its um, its, its member states essentially to be funding uh, various kinds of projects in the various member states. But m many of these member states are um, incredibly poor coming out of colonization and so on, the colonial period. So essentially we have uh, the rise and the rise to some extent of, um, well, the rise of uh, the OECD, but not the rise and the rise. And I'm just going to take us to the next kind of period. So UNESCO is kind of limping along to some extent. Um, it is collecting statistics. It's dependent on nations to collect those, those statistics. Um, Rosa Kasur and colleagues will write about that and actually describe how kind of gappy um, if the nation state depends on how much money they've got, they're not kind of joined up, they're not collecting the statistics in the same kind of way. Um, and UNESCO basically is kind of depending upon these kind of value based um, futures. Um, and a number of reports, uh, the FOR report, the Delors report, um, they come get periodically kind of rolled out. So this is a report that to some extent, to a large extent, along with the FOE report, is responding to the 1970s crisis. So the 1970s crisis is a global um, crisis. Um, it's the exhaustion of the post-war development uh, model. It's often referred to as the oil shocks. 
Um, but fundamentally, it's capitalism in terms of US-based capitalism as the kind of flagship had sort of exhausted its development model. Um, the production of goods has moved out into the Asian region and the question for the United States, particularly UK, Australia and so on, is on what basis might they move forward a development project that is not dependent on the production of goods. And the OECD ultimately goes off in the direction of um, thinking of the development of a knowledge-based economy, but this is, this is a construction. It's an imagined constructed economy and all co economies are constructed. There's nothing natural about the way in which we organize our economic activities. There's nothing, there's nothing natural um, or essential about capitalism. Ca capitalism is, is produced as a particular set of social arrangements. UNESCO is often very critical of capitalism and you'll see in the latest international uh, commission on the futures, it's critical of the growth paradigm. It's, very, it's asking for degrowth um, and so on. So in the 1990s, the Delors report reflects on the economic nature of the agendas shaping education that all out economic growth can no longer be viewed as the ideal way of reconciling material progress with equity, respect for the human condition. I mean, if you think of it, um, that's, and, and Javier kind of mentioned, we're into the third, um, with it, well, we're there into yeah, the third decade of the, the 21st century. Um, and if we reflect back in the 1990s, um, oh, UNESCO is still worrying about nature, um, equity, um, future generations. In fact, it's almost a debate that, that feels very fresh and very now. Um, the OECD nevertheless continued to expand its use of statistics. So it uses the 1990s. It goes head to head in a competition with UNESCO. It basically, UNESCO finds itself in a situation where it um, has to accept a commission that reviews its statistical um, tools and fundamentally, um, this is US backed money, fundamentally UNESCO is found wanting and statistics um, gets taken away to some extent and recreated in a, 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 an institute. But the OECD grasps this and the OECD then grasps the basis on which it can take a future forward. So we've got two futures now on the table um, for UNESCO, it's the complete man. These are the conditions for the complete man, a philosophical um, open-ended debate about the future versus education for competition, um, the global competition. If we go to the final one, and we can do a little bit of exploring um, in, in some of the questions, um, but what happens when that future back here Global competition, neoliberalism or auto-liberalism for UNESCO. So, you know, auto-liberal basically meaning a variation of neoliberalism um, with some degree of kind of state, but nevertheless backing public-private partnerships, um, competition, um, global governance, um, and, and so on. So I want to argue here that a future arrived. Um, and what we know about the future to do with global competitiveness, um, the idea of a knowledge-based economy um, and so on, is that not all boats, as was promised, not everyone benefited from this imagined future. So on the one hand, you see the OECD now confronting neoliberalism and the problems that neoliberalism has presented uh, with um, the idea of um, it has to roll out the idea of global competences, um, but it gets into trouble with the global competences because um, those global competences um, look incredibly Western. And, uh, and many of the um, member states or any of them collecting um, global competence data, um, they had to pay for the uh, data uh, collection, but they didn't collect that. They 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 didn't report that data, and they didn't collect that that data. They that they had to pay for it. And if you actually look at that effort to try and manage the problems of growing social inequality, um, growing um, concerns around the distribution of wealth um, across different, um, even within nation states, um, these have become incredibly. Um, problematic, rising uh, tensions between different groups, um, issues, of, uh, movements of people, migration and so on. On the other hand, UNESCO um, gets the job, the task of 
trying to broker in global citizenship as part of the sustainable development goals. Um, it establishes the International Commission on the Futures of Education, which reports this year. It tries to up um, some work around futures literacy, Raoul Miller uh, specifically um, developing what he calls anticipation as a discipline. But my argument in the paper is that Miller's work is in a, an area of um, the work of UNESCO that in fact doesn't really get any public airing. And so now what we've got is a major kind of issue on the table. Um, and it my, my argument would be here is that UNESCO, the OECD to some extent kind of now faces the limits of its capacity to govern certainly with the governing um, ideology to do with, with um, uh, economic global economic competitiveness. What the OECD has done, the, has, has then rolled out what it calls a learning compass. And if you look closely here, you'll see anticipation. So it's still working with the idea of the individual. It's um, shifted its uh, focus away from global competitiveness and is talking about well-being 2030. Um, it's trying to take a view of uh, education is also happening out in the community. But nevertheless, this is the neoliberal or it's definitely the, li the liberal subject. Okay, This is not a collective. This is not a community. And fundamentally, um, it's an individual taking responsibility for um, becoming globally comp uh, competent, um, who individually have to reconcile um, tensions and dilemmas, create new value and so on as individuals rather than the collective. Um, over here in, the, in, in, in UNESCO, there's efforts to um, engage in anticipation in the 21st century, but I've already made the argument uh, fundamentally that it's got very, it's had very little traction. Um, but in the paper, I say a little bit about the International Commission on the Futures of Education, but it's difficult to see that it won't be fairly similar to actually what's happened to the um, Delors report and the Faux report much earlier. So let's just draw it to a conclusion. And um, so just to remind you, what I've been exploring is in the first phase, in many senses, both are what we might call prefigurative. prefigurative. Um, in that first, for both the OECD and UNESCO, there's this view of a teleology of an unfolding future, quite Darwinian in many ways. So modernization theory is premised on the basis that um, everyone will go along that path of an, becoming modern at some point. Okay, so modernization theory is that you're moving away from um, being a, um, a, a traditional society into becoming modern and it's science that will help deliver. So that first phase is teleological, it's an unfolding, it's prefigured. Um, and I made the case that there's a separation between the two organizations, between a philosophical versus a, a technical um, kind of an approach. In the second, both organizations move to seeing the future somewhat more contingently as mediated by mission. So the FOE and the uh, FOR report and the Delors report are simply trying to inject a, a, a new set of ideas um, into UNESCO. And for the OECD, it takes on the mantle particularly of uh, neoliberalism and global co competitiveness and tries to govern using uh, statistics and it does it very effectively for a good period of time and fundamentally claims um, but I'd say the moment for the hegemon are perhaps in the balance um, and we see this with this final period where there we see the limits to neoliberalism and where the OECD and UNESCO are now having to manage um, present futures through things like global citizenship global competences and so on when they deliver negative outcomes um, in both cases, to some extent, um, they're both now dependent upon anticipatory strategies, sites and devices that are profoundly, the global citizenship framework is um, deeply, deeply Western and modern, if you take a close look at it. So just by way of conclusion, then, I would want to argue that um, the uh, Histories, mandates and modes of internal governance do shape the nature and range of anticipatory strategies they get sort of locked in with uh, the OECD and it never quite gets its way out of, of that. Um, the 
United States particularly, it, it funded um, the OECD. It uh, took issue always typically with UNESCO. It typically, and it's been the biggest funder um, of the OECD and over time. And if you have any doubt about that, if you just take a look at the way in which the OECD most recently has lined itself up quite closely to Asia Society, which basically is a front uh, foundation for um, a front organization for large corporate interests and certainly corporate financial interests. Um, uh, and, and so the, the tighter relationship between the United States and the OECD is, is, is there. The philosophy of the future versus science of the future make a big difference to the way in which politics do and don't get aired. But ultimately, um, we can say that when that future has arrived and the promise of the future is not equally shared, um, the, both organizations have had to employ different kinds of anticipatory strategies, in this case for the OECD, the global compass. Um, and it'll be quite interesting to see how that kind of plays out over the next um, five to 10 years. Um, both organizations um, depend on promising legitimacy. So this speaks to the fourth point, um, but it isn't in control of the future. And so when that future arrives, uh, fails to arrive that's been promised, it then is faced with a legitimation uh, shortfall. And so I think I'll end my presentation there, probably gone on a bit longer than I had anticipated, um, but I will want, I want to say thank you so much and I look forward to um, questions, um, any questions, I've got a couple in chat, um, but um, I'll pass it back to Xavier to, um, orchestrate the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for this wonderful speech. And I think it opens uh, so many questions and so many uh, reflections on the students that they just started now uh, the course on actors in education and development. I am sure you still have not have time to explore deeply UNESCO and OECD, but now you have probably a uh, new lens to observe uh, these institutions from, from these periods that, that Susan analyzed uh, interestingly uh, with this perspective. Um, there's so many, I'm, I'm sure I have so many uh, things that came to my mind um, and I will comment some of them, but uh, I would prefer now to open the floor to any uh, student or PhD student or professor or whoever is here to, to ask any, to make any comment or to ask any question to Susan. So use, as we said, either the chat or just uh, just speak and that's it. <laughs> okay, so any comment, question as a first reaction? So if you want to post a, a, a question in the chat as well. Yeah, use either the chat or uh, well. Okay, uh, while we are waiting, let me let me start with the uh, with the Ari show. Yeah, Ariana has a question. I think. Oh, sorry. Okay, Ariana, please. Hi, hi, Susan. Thank you very much uh, for your talk today. I think it was super interesting. Um, I'm actually beginning my MA dissertation for Globet, so I'm from the previous cohort. Um, and I am sort of exploring what you were mentioning at an international organization level, but at a classroom level, mm -hmm. sort of contextualized within the classroom. And I was wondering if you had any um, ideas or um, yeah, anything to, to say about how these maybe differences on how education is perceived by uh, international organizations is then recontextualized within classrooms and in actual a practice. So yeah, thank you. So it's a, lo a lovely question. And I guess what's really crucial about your question is, um, I think there's a tendency to say, because the, let's say if we took the OECD, um, when it represents its um, hierarchies of countries who's done well on PISA and so on, that we assume that actually it's 
filtered its way down and into the classroom and it shapes classroom practice. Um, and a PhD student of mine, um, Israel um, Morena Salter, um, can actually show that teachers are sort of aware in Mexico, but actually it doesn't alter what they do really in practice. Um, and so there's, I think, huge scope to actually look at the way in which um, those international discourses or their various projects and so on do and don't maybe feel, filter down into national context. So most um, for, for UNESCO, um, they'll all have their uh, national commissions. And so it may or may not be the case um, that in fact, things actually happen in classroom spaces, but fundamentally in many of these classroom spaces, it needs uh, resources, financial resources in order to implement some of these kinds of materials um, and so on. So I think this is a really important empirical question for you um, to maybe look at, um, you could be even looking at sustainable development goals or global citizenship um, education and the extent to which um, global citizenship or even discussions around what does it mean to be a global citizen um, actually um, take their cue from, let's say, UNESCO. Um, UNESCO has produced teaching materials um, for the global citizenship framework for teachers. Um, and again, it would be interesting to know how much take up there is and even indeed whether teachers would think that that, that material is relevant um, because it, and I'll just use a, a quick example. Um, when they start to look at, um, they start to look at the idea of global citizenship, but they basically gesture, they, so they take liberty, equality, and fraternity as the three big ideas, which we know come from the French Republic. And they look around the world and they say, um, where do we see liberty, equality, fraternity being espoused as part of the citizenship agenda. So they go off to South Africa and they'll say, oh, that's there, Ubuntu. Um, and my sense is that that's the wrong place to start. Um, it, what The place to start might be not that you're looking to find the French, let's say cosmopolitan kind of version, modern version, but actually how is the notion of the global citizen represented culturally in some of those discourses, you might find Indigenous Australian Aboriginals would have a very different way of trying to think about those kinds of issues um, and where the, the, the global is actually even uh, the planet. So, so we could be thinking of the, the planet, uh, Mother Earth, very different kinds of cultural resources that would actually feed. So um, lovely, lovely project, I think. Take a look at, um, and I can send a few things to Shavir, um, the OECD special issue that came out earlier this year. Um, Israel's work is there. Um, but I think for re young researchers like yourselves who have a chance to get out and potentially do empirical work, um, then these are wonderful projects for you. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'll Thank give you very now. much, Susan. Yeah. Um, Isabella, I think she wants to ask. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Susan, for the opportunity to hear your research. Uh, actually, my question is more a comment uh, related somehow to Ariana's comment. Well, I'm a not only a researcher, but also a teacher from Brazil. And during your uh, exposition, I keep in I keep um, wondering how uh, UNESCO and other IOs could engage more with the local teachers and students, uh, especially thinking about the future. If they are the guardians of the future in education, uh, as they plan, uh, how we could think about? I don't know if we have um, data about this engagement. But as a teacher, I feel that, of course, I, I see uh, UNESCO and other IOs uh, in my reality, especially because of, uh, as a researcher, as, um, anyway, but not as much as I would love to, uh, especially thinking about the, the future of the uh, critical citizenship and global citizenship uh, of the students. So I would love to hear more about your thinking. For example, if we have some material that I maybe I could uh, read more 
about this engagement, uh, especially thinking uh, in this guardian of future of education as they are big, but I don't see how they um, are improving in this engagement with the local one, from the macro to the micro. I don't know if it was a little bit confused, but thank you very much, Professor. So, so th thank you, Isabella, for your your question. And I I, I think um, what you what you I think um, uh, pointing to is really um, a kind of legitimation shortfall in many cases. Um, so these international organisations um, like UNESCO and the OECD, um, the their um, the OECD, particularly in governments, put significant amounts of money into the OECD in order to do this data collection and so on, which is actually done by a commercial uh, company. Um, I mean, if, if I think of the case of Brazil, um, and, and I mean, the national plan, uh, I think, that was actually uh, released in 2014, wasn't it? Um, it was probably in the kind of the, the, the kind of dying moments of um, Dilma, um, actually there. Um, but that that was a that was an attempt at the federal level to secure a future um, that, to some extent, embraced some elements in Brazil of trying to recognise the the African um, distinctive African cultural futures that were part of the Brazilian kind of narrative. Uh, there. And I have little doubt, um, though I'd have to go back and have a look at that report, that there would be efforts to look up, certainly possibly to UNESCO, certainly the way in which the 2014 national plan um, that's to be then rolled out and over um, a particular period of time. Um, there's a, a really interesting paper that um, Catherine Moller, I'm just going to put her um, surname in chat. Um, she's written um, M O double R um, that's come out more recently. Um, she's well worth following up. She's a uh, was based in the United States. She's now in Glasgow, but she um, she's a um, Portuguese speaker and has done quite a lot of work in the case of Brazil. But what she actually shows is over time those though that kind of highly promissory discourse that would have legitimated itself, particularly looking at UNESCO in this idea of um, citizenship, rights of citizenship, diversity, and, and so on, um, over time basically gets stripped out. So by the time you have the different stages of the consultation that are actually going on, there's that stripping out and you would be absolutely aware of the different um, religious kind of, um, and almost sort of military claims that are actually going on. So I'm gonna then kind of focus on, um, a, a, a kind of definition I use in the early part of the paper, um, which is actually on transnational governing. So global governing, it probably it's better to talk about what's happening is um, transnational. So there's an effort by these guardians to direct um, national education systems, um, but typically it's through national, the national level. Now, if you've got Brazil and it's a subnational predominantly down to a local, then it becomes quite difficult for them to actually penetrate the different, um, let's say, states of Brazil. We could go to Mexico and make the same kind of. So this is these are kind of struggles that are kind of taking place about whose future, what future, um, and then how it might be inserted into a local classroom. And it's not accidental that um, the OECD has now got um, what it calls PISA for you, and it tries to reach out and also speak quite directly to teachers. So it's aware of, I would say, of the limitations it faces when it looks and tries to govern a nation, because that nation at the national level doesn't necessarily have um, the legitimate authority itself, let's say in the case of Brazil, um, in order to, 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 to govern. Thank you. There's a question by Prelen in the chat, and he asks you, Susan, do you think funding remains a tremendous factor influencing the future of education in the third world developing countries, and in what way? Um, you, pro, pro, am I saying it right? Uh, Prelen? Yeah, 
Um, uh, I'll get it. Uh, the, we are uh, learning also how to pronounce his name, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but, but absolutely, it's, it's, I mean, if you think of what's going on at the moment, um, then I would say uh, not only going into um, the pre-COVID period, there were major, major, major funding shortfalls um, that, um, and, and that those shortfalls were exaggerated with the 2008 financial crisis. Um, the, and what we knew, and there was a piece I remember writing, if you actually looked at how much money um, the, those not paying their tax were actually had kind of scrolled away in tax havens, if you took that money of, let's say, wealthy entrepreneurs, capitalists and so on, out of the tax havens and actually put it into uh, education, it would actually solve the access to quality education. Um, I think it was in the order of um, 8.6 billion, something along that kind of line. And COVID has exa exaggerated that uh, because essentially if your safe way of actually learning is to learn um, using some kind of device um, and that's dependent on some kind of bad bandwidth, um, can you imagine, you know, the only device in a home possibly might be the telephone? Um, so the learning devices... Um, and the big ed tech companies are not rushing in to distribute free technology um, at all um, there. So I think there's a major, major commitment that's going to have to be made to um, particularly low income countries to enable um, that concern um, of rising um, social inequalities uh, globally. Any other question or comment? Can I um, can I jump into the the debate, Susan? I found it really interesting uh, your approach. There's one thing that that actually um, makes me reflect on 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 this type of of analysis, which is: Could you consider in some way that uh, the, com the I mean the competition for defining uh, futures in education? And especially in the analysis of these in, in these two institutions, yeah, I, I like very much this distinction that that it's also included in the paper between the ethics of possibility and the ethics of probability. Would you would you really say that? I mean, it's so easy to to understand that UNESCO follows an ethics of possibility and OECD the ethics of probability, but it's it's just that. UNESCO is the only chance they have in this debate. I mean, if they want to, to have a, a, a voice in the global debates of the future of education, the, um, UNESCO cannot compete anymore, isn't it? In terms of ethics of probability, despite, as you clearly mentioned, uh, when, when UNESCO start the idea of scientific internationalism, internationalism and, the, and the idea also of, of UNESCO Institute of Statistics was very clear to have have uh, a word on that. And, and the second question I might have is whether, how difficult it is even for international organizations to define futures in education, which are so much contextual. I mean, we know even that, and that's something that really strikes me about, about PISA, how powerful it can be as an instrument to define the future when there's no single variable in PISA that actually um, tells us that uh, that has enough explanatory power for all education systems. So education is so contextual that trying to define standardized type of futures, it's it's a nonsense, <laughs> isn't it? So how how the OECD is able to to become so much hegemonic today, even dealing with this contradiction of having to to deal with standardization in context of of highly contextual results in education systems. I um, have a lot of things, but we can have, uh, we, we'll, we'll keep talking later on, on that. Yeah, the, no, no, I think though that, I mean, I have a little bit of an issue with, um, what, one of the reviewers suggested that I used um, a Padurai's ethics of possibility and um, ethics, of, ethics of future possibility and ethics of future probability. But the problem that UNESCO constantly faces really is that its um, ethics? Its ethics is a bit problematic because it is an ethics still 
thoroughly rinsed with by Western cosmopolitanism. Okay, so mm -hmm. my example around the French Republic. So even when it wants to, and it talks about um, developing or going off in the direction of what it calls a kind of, you know, taking into account different um, cosmologies of the world. And it can't actually put that word out there. It doesn't use the word cosmology. Um, it's a, it, it, and, and for others, just it, it, let's say if we were to think of some of the indigenous communities, they've got a, co they've got a very distinct social ontology, a cosmology. Okay? Um, if you think of indigenous Aboriginals in Australia, which is where I was kind of brought up, or we could go down to Peru and you could think of different um, either indigenous and other groups and, and so on. So, the, so I, I, I think for me, there's a little bit of an issue around the generousness of, of a pagiarized idea of the ethics of possibility, because actually we've got already a pretty narrowed set of possibilities. And in fact, the closest UNESCO gets to the word cosmology is it's, um, it's, it's cosmology. And that means a theory of the big bang. So essentially, and it's more or less, you know, either you get creationists or not, um, you know, either Darwin was right and you've got evolution theory or basically you've got the hand of God and that's how that kind of kind of splits up. Um, but you're, ab you're absolutely right um, to say that um, the OECD, though it talks, it, it's an, it's an, an a, well, politicians have somehow let themselves be deluded by the confusion, the conceptual confusion between standards and standardization. So it's offering standardization, but it presents itself, it presents it as standards. And we can see we're in a battle with the Minister for Education um, that who got dismissed last week. So up the revolution, we won. Um, but essentially we've had to keep on driving this publicly that in fact, the politicians are willfully and deliberately um, using the word um, standard, but what they mean is standardization, one size fits all. Um, and uh, essentially, because essentially it's governing through one size fits all, you know, it's either this hierarchical um, literacy, numeracy, science, um, and, and, and so on. Um, so to some extent, there's a leg legitimation issue um, here and then I'd probably say I'm just going to make the final remark and then I'll go to um, is it Ciela's question it is that to the extent that we became complicit in saying oh they're just governing by numbers when we academics could have been offering a slightly um, I would say empirically bottom up analysis of the, the, the limits of the reach of the governing um, and so I think that trope of governing by numbers, um, and it's not Satiria's fault that she's become very popular with that, but it's very limited. It doesn't, because it now is not working at multiple scales, it's not looking at the local, it's not looking at the contradictions, um, it just says the number is there and therefore governing is kind of happening. So the academy has been a bit complicit. And I'm just hoping all of you on this, um, in this session today, takes up that mantle and then thinks about um, the, the, the different ways in which you can nuance, um, because in your nuancing of the evidence, you're also shaking, I think, the tree of certainty that the international organizations along with national politicians kind of hang on to. And the more they hang on to that in that way, and the more we reinforce it, the more that becomes part of the hegemonic understanding. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to, because I'm concerned about the time, and I'm going to read two questions that students raise. One is, I don't know if I pronounce correctly, Gel is your name? Uh, Yellow. Okay, sorry. I was wondering about the role of NGOs, private actors, civil society, etc., as compared to national states when it comes to the legitimacy and the deficit of legitimacy of UNESCO and the OECD. And uh, well, so many questions are coming up now. <laughs> the, um, uh, you're okay. actually right. I mean, there's um, the, the World Bank at one moment in its um, in its uh, strategic planning document makes a fairly radical shift away from thinking about a system of education um, 
that didn't include for-profit actors to a system of education that actually included the for-profit actors. And there's been a kind of normalizing of um, the inclusion of for-profit companies. Okay, and we see with COVID the buy-up takeover, buy-up takeover um, by ed tech firms for profit. Um, some of you may or may not know that here in the UK, we've got um, about, apart from the classically understood universities, there's about 833 um, providers of higher education and in many cases they're for profits, can award a degree, a university degree, um, don't need to offer anything more than just one discipline and possibly don't need to do research. So there's all, so there's a, an effort to normalize, I would probably say lots of different actors um, to extract value out of the education world. And it's an easy sector to extract value from because every, every parent wants their child to do well and wants a good education system. And so they're quite prepared to potentially kind of fund that. If I go to... Um, yeah, let, let me one. just read these two questions and then yeah. I'll give the floor to Tony because I see he wants to uh, talk also. Uh, one is uh, Bakatawar says, my question is, have there been any educational policies so rooted in the neoliberal heroic narrative across the world that have in fact had very dire consequences in developing and or war struck countries? And the other question is made by Sadaf. And uh, he says, my question is, why is that we don't see any student bodies get involved as active partners at international, national, and institutional levels in the development, monitoring, and maintenance of the quality provision of cross-border higher education? Or are there any, what are your views, uh, your views about this? Um, Susan, feel free to take one or the two of them. <laughs> so, Duff, I mean, I, I mean, I know it's often a bit problematic, but essentially some of the student bodies, um, I've been quite impressed with the levels of organising of some of the student bodies, and particularly around climate change and so on, and the, the level of kind of activism um, that's kind of emerging. And I, I think we learn to become activists, um, much like the feminist movement, second wave feminism, you know, learned became quite quite active, quite activist in their, their kind of approach. Um, and I'll just take the, um, have, have there been any ne uh, educational policies so rooted in neoliberal narrative that they've had dire consequences? Absolutely, they've had dire consequences for, um, because the solution to um, the, the crisis and the chaos and the violence is more neoliberalism. But actually more neoliberalism or neoliberalism and the, the workings out of neoliberalism and particularly if David Harvey was talking to you, he'd talk about the displacement of accumulation, um, typically goes off looking for investments in moments of, um, as Naomi Klein would kind of define it, um, periods of almost manufactured crisis. Um, so, if, if, or natural crises that actually see this immediate insertion of private interests um, in there. So if I stop and then I give the final question to Tony. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Susan, for your great uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned something about uh, precision governance and in the last European conference on educational research, there were several papers on this. And I was wondering, how do you think that, uh, or if you can expand on, on how precision governance can, can contribute to, to strengthen or, or to consolidate these uh, anticipatory governance strategies. So it's typically in Dutch group, the kind of, uh, not Dutch, uh, Finnish group who particularly kind of have got quite a large project on, on that. It's, it's sort of big data -y kind of stuff, Tony. And it's a phrase I've probably wouldn't, and probably I might delete that from my slide. Um, I'd spoken to that group at a particular kind of moment, but this idea of, um, using uh, big data particularly in order to get closer and closer and closer. But actually, if we really look at uh, what we've been describing, um, big data is typically offering you a one size fits all. So it's hardly precise in that sense. Um, where the precision might well come in, if you start to think of the global compass um, that the OECD has got on the table, um, that, that's some of the colleagues have kind of said that's incredibly scary because you target the individual and you actually 
target the individual's kind of motivation and the resources and uh, that kind of thing. So I think there's quite a lot of work to do around that. And I'm not 100% convinced that that's a particularly useful concept for the moment. Feels a bit mechanical. Okay, uh, I'm sure we could keep talking for a long time, but uh, we don't want to take more time of Suzanne. She's been so kind to uh, to to give uh, her talk for this opening as a this opening lecture. So please join me now. Put your microphones on and join me on to a big clap. <laughs> so Suzanne, thank you so much <laughs> for your time and the debate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we'll have uh, more opportunities for sure you'll have more opportunities to either to, to talk with Susan directly or through her papers that you will know that you will have to read some of them during these courses <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and to know more about, about her fantastic work in, in uh, uh, economic policy and education. So I want to well, say thanks. good luck to thanks all so of you. Enjoy your academic journey and I have no doubt that you'll actually be diving into what will be really fascinating projects so at some point I'd really love Xavier and the colleagues to invite me back where you might be doing some presentations I'd love to be there just yeah, to in Barcelona it. then not, not okay. online anymore okay. Okay. I can I can I can, <laughs> I can deal with that one too I can <laughs> we'll do we'll do our best to bring you here of course okay guys uh thank you all for attending and uh I'll see you around, okay? We are starting, well, the, our courses very, very soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Have a good evening. Thank you, Suzanne. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.